please rise to welcome His Royal Highness Prince Daniel. So we've been working on something that we're very, very excited about. We've been working very, very hard for the last few months and weeks. And I'm really proud of what the things we're going to show you today. Let's start with why we think we really need electric planes. And I think you've heard a lot of those reasons already, but I think it's good to repeat them anyway. There are three big challenges for regional air travel. The first one is actually profitability. It's really, really difficult to run a regional airline today with the unit economics that are there. And this is important because when an airline can't operate, it really affects the connectivity of our country. In Sweden, we have a great infrastructure of airports, and they are mostly being underused. Finally, the most important thing is the climate. And you can say that this is something that aviation is being unfairly singled out here, but let's be perfectly clear, we need to solve this. This is the heart. ES-19, it's a 19-seater all-electric aircraft with a range of 400 kilometers. And our goal is that this aircraft will be certified for commercial service by 2026. Since we star started posting job ads on our website, we have received over 1,200 uh, applications. Today we're a team of 12 people, and the plan is to grow our company to 70 people by next year and to 300 by 2025. But we have a great team here, and uh, today you will meet some of them and see what we all are working on together. I worked on both the SOP 340 and the SOP 2000 as a flight test engineer. They were both first-class aircraft, and they were definitely leaders in their, uh, in their time. In fact, the SOP 340 was uh, statistically the safest airplane in the world, and the SOP 2000 to this day still holds three world records for time to climb. Unfortunately, the end of the 90s saw a preference for jet aircraft rather than turboprops, and that was basically because oil was cheap and nobody was thinking about the environment. That was the frame of mind in the, in the 90s. So I had an opportunity to move to the USA where I worked on several uh, regional and business aircraft. And as Anders mentioned, one interesting one was the, the Honda Jet experience because that too was a startup uh, company. So we went through a lot of the things that we're gonna do here at Heart Aerospace, and we're going to grow rapidly. We're going to hire talent from around the world. Going forward, we're going to work on the formal design and certification phase. I must say, I think EASA has been extremely proactive and um, supportive in developing the regulatory environment to allow this to happen, and we've had some successful early meetings. So, thank you very much. This is great. It really is uh, like an honor to be a part of this project. It's uh, just so much fun so far, and I really look forward to keeping it going. So let's uh, have a look at the aeroplane. So the ES-19, as you will have seen some from some of the pictures, is a conventional aeroplane. It is very similar to a lot of other aircraft, like the Dash 7 and Dash 8 that you'll see all over the world. We're doing this because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We know what's successful from the past, and we can use modern tools to make it as efficient as it can possibly be. Approximately 1,000 cubic meters of air hit the aeroplane every second during flight. Roughly, that's all of the air inside of this hangar. Our challenge is to use this air to lift the aeroplane up without slowing it down too much through air resistance. In the past, you had to build a plane and test it to fully understand its aerodynamics, which is difficult because you can't see the air. The computers that we have today are able to test out different scenarios early in the design process, and we use computational fluid dynamics. Large companies often invest millions of dollars to get it right. This is why we make use of one of the largest computers in the world, Amazon's web servers. 
As the wing creates lift, it also forms a big swirl on both ends. This is called the wingtip vortex. This vortex slows the aircraft down, and unfortunately, it cannot be avoided. However, we can utilize it by placing a small vertical wing in its wake. This wing acts as a kind of sail, which recovers part of the lost energy. And by doing this, we can improve the power consumption of ES-19 by more than 6%. So with our tools, we can predict precisely the impact of the propellers on the airframe. In this way, we can avoid numerous problems. Older aircraft use three to four bladed propellers like you see here. They create a loud noise and many strong vibrations because they have to spin very quickly. We use a seven bladed propeller, which allows us to spin our blades slower and therefore reduces vibrations and noise significantly. By doing this to many different parts of the aircraft, we can make an aircraft which is more efficient, quieter, more reliable, without incorporating additional development risks. This is our subscale model, which is built out of high-end and lightweight uh, composites, such as carbon and glass fiber. We also have 3D printed parts, such as nacelles and uh, winglets. This model will fly in the next coming months. So finally, all of the data from our simulations and experiments can be fed into the professional flight simulator that we have here in the hangar. That means that we can get valuable feedback from the most important component in any aircraft, which is the pilot. As you can see from the lines in this animation, the simulator uses real force calculations to determine how the aircraft behaves. So it's not just a game. This is a real scientific tool. Now you heard about how we approached aerodynamics. But I want to talk about the second thing is to build a lightweight structure, which is equally important. And we knew we needed a really, really experienced team to work with this. The only problem was that they were scattered all over the world. So they've been working on digging away on how building the structure. Uh, this is a screenshot from the CAD model that we've been working on right now. We're continuously improving it. And most of the time, uh, they've spent actually on building the wing. The wing is the most heavy part of the structure, which is the thing that actually holds it together. And it's going to be carrying very heavy batteries as well. We've also built a mock-up of the cabin using actual aircraft seat, and you can see it beside you there. We want to spend the rest of our time here talking about the propulsion system. So to build a rather complex system, both safe and efficiently, you really have to understand all the details of all the components. And this is why at this stage we're trying to build the, the entire electric drivetrain by ourselves. So we have been working on uh, the motor controller it is uh, the lifted. unit here. <laughs> so this thing can uh, operate up to 800 volts. I think our components can take at least 1,100 volts in it, and it can do 350 kilowatts roughly. Here is one of the battery modules that we're going to have, and it has 504 uh, 18650 cells, and uh, temperature sensors and voltage sensors and some other sensors. So this is one of the nacelles, and the module we saw before, we're going to have 30 of those in each nacelle. And one of the things that we're doing right now that I think is really important is this battery in the loop simulator. So we have the X-plane model that the flight science team is working on, that Tom talked about. And what we can do then, we can take one of those sub-modules, we connect them into a bunch of halogen lamps, and then we run different flights to them. And here you can see we take off, and then we load it, and they light up. And then we can see that when we take off, we draw the most power and during climb. And then we go to cruise, where we kind of keep stable power. And during the descent phase, we barely draw any power. And we have been doing many of these flights for a while now, trying different routes, different scenarios, where we have to, um, like diversion between aircraft. For example, when you're about to land, you have not so much battery left, and you have to draw full power again. And uh, from what we've done so far, I'm actually I'm really positive with the results, so it looks like uh, we're not having any major problems with heating or anything else, and we seem to be getting very close to the range that we predicted first by doing very simple cal uh, calculations, so I think we really can do this. So going from batteries, we're going to end up with talking a little bit about motors. We really need to build an electric motor that has the size and power to replace a jet engine. And here it is. So 
So, so through the past years, we built this world-class propulsion system, which we believe has really, really high efficiency. And we're only getting started. So this is still like the first iteration of what we're doing, and we're seeing that it's really, really good. The rest of the aircraft, the rest of the airframe is traditional. So we thought, why not take the plane and take the things that's innovative and new and put that into a rig? And that's the rig that you have there right now. And we're slowly, slowly, and very cautiously starting to test it. That's some of the things that we're doing. I'm really happy to be able to share them with all of you here. And uh, I hope that we can make this a uh, yearly occurrence or something like that, so you can come back here and see how this aircraft progresses from this vision to a fully certified aircraft. So thank you once again for coming here and listening to us. <laughs>